All right, today's scripture comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. Please stand as able once you've found the scripture. It's kind of nice to have it in front of you because uh, we're going to reference it throughout the message, but it will also be behind me, projected, um, and we're going to have an alternate reading, which means I'll read the first verse, and uh, we'll all respond with the verse after that. We'll keep going back and forth until the ends. So again, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. May the Lord bless the reading of God's word for us today. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live shall no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, friends, it is 2015, and it is a new year, new possibilities, and, and it's a time when we look forward to change, and maybe for some of us, when we get in the midst of life, we're not really thinking about newness, we're not really thinking about change, but as the calendar rolls over, it's very natural to do that. Uh, during the New Year's festivities, we were watching the New Year's Rockin' Eve uh, on TV. And, you know, in Times Square, uh, they have this big celebration. They set off fireworks. They have, like, a huge countdown, you know, uh, on the side of a building. And there's all these people crowded in there. And, and you know, we're watching it on TV. And me and my wife kind of, like, look at that and we're like, how do they use the restroom? You know, like, you're just, like, packed in there. You can't leave, you know. Like, what do they do? Well, I guess it's one way to keep warm, right? I I don't know. But uh, so, you know, they're out there, and then, you know, there's all these festivities, and they count down, and when they get down to zero, and it's New Year, everyone's going nuts. Happy New Year! And people are kissing each other, and people are, like, celebrating, and they're jumping up and down, and they forget the fact that they have to pee, and it's just, it's a big party, right? A big celebration. And after, you know, some of the New Year's festivities and that kind of, uh, that, that euphoria kind of settles down a little bit. Um, one of the people uh, from uh, the, the uh, TV station, you know, starts interviewing people and asks them, what is your New Year's resolution for 2015? And so they interview these different people, and, you know, one girl says, um, I want to be happy in 2015. And then they go to this other guy, you know, who kind of looks like it works out a little bit, and they're like, what's your New Year's resolution? And he's like, my New Year's resolution is to remain really good looking. And then they go to this other girl, and, and she's like a, a little more reflective, and she's like, in 2015, I want to look inside myself, and I want to see what fears I have, and I want to overcome that. Okay, next person, and they just keep moving on, right? And so, friends, as we see that, you know, a lot of people's New Year's resolutions are about themselves, about their personal happiness. You know, that's the way that a lot of us look at life. And when we think about what we want in life, it is to be happy, as a lot of those people said. Um, And, you know, friends, today's message is new creation. And I believe that God is doing new things in us, and he desires to do new things. And in a way that for many of us, as we come to church, I mean, we all want to be happy too. You know, we want to be happy in Christ. You know, our whole theme for this year, for uh, the school year, um, and so it's carrying over into this uh, January and beyond, is the idea of having all in Christ, what we call abundant life and love in Christ, right? And we want that. We want abundant life, you know? And a part of 
the newness that God wants to bring is this sort of life. So what does that look like? I want to take a look at the scripture because I think that there might be some things that we learn. And, you know, we're coming off this retreat, and, and I kind of slipped in that prayer, you know, uh, for uh, the sleep-deprived servant who, you know, happens to be me just because, you know, we came from this retreat and it's been awesome. And we didn't sleep much, but we had a great time. And, you know, God has been teaching us some things. And, and I want to share some of those things with you because I think that one of the blessings of having a retreat um, and the way we try to design it um, is that we make the last uh, message, the last worship service of the retreat is here at church. You know, we want to connect what we learned at the retreat with the rest of our lives. Um, and also, we want to share those blessings with you. And so, some of you didn't know you were going on a retreat, but here you are. You thought you were just coming to church, but you're at a retreat. You know, is that kind of cool? <laughs> so, you didn't even have to sleep on the floor and camp and go without a shower for two days. I mean, no one did that besides me, I think. But anyways, I digress. So, <laughs> but friends, you know, there are some things that God wants to teach us about being a new creation. Yeah, I mean, I'm up here. You're over there. You don't have to smell me. It's all good. Um, but friends, um, there are things that God wants to, to uh, share with us. And what I think we find in this passage is a game changer, something that changes us. And we're going to find out what that is. So let's take a look at verse 14. And it says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Friends, that's the, the game changer, that Christ died for all. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Friends, there is a lot in the Christian life that we are told that our lives are not just about ourselves anymore. You know, we can't live our life thinking like, okay, it's just about me. It's just about my happiness, right? There's more to this life. There's more that God wants. The abundant life is not us trying to squeeze as much enjoyment and pleasure and meaning out of life just for ourselves, but to find ourselves in God and to find that when we are able to go to God and say, God, this life is yours, you use it as you will, that's when we find our purpose. That's when we find the meaning in life. But how do you get there? Because, I mean, you know, we're all selfish in some way, you know, and, and it kind of makes sense that in a lot of ways, even for many of us who come to know Christ, I mean, maybe some of, you know, some of us have grown up in the church, but, you know, maybe for some of you who haven't, how did you come to want to, you know, go to church or want to get to know God? I mean, wasn't it really, in some way, self-interest? You know, kind of looking inside yourself and thinking, hey, you know, I, I want meaning in my life, or um, I, I want to figure out this kind of spiritual hunger that I have. And friends, that impulse is not bad, but what this passage tells us is that he doesn't want to leave us there. The love that God has for us changes us. It makes us different. And so... Um, he, everything changes. The way we live, we're no longer living for ourselves. We're living for Christ. We're living for new purposes. And also, the way that we look at people and the way we look at Christ changes. Though we once regarded Christ from a worldly point of view, we no longer do so. So friends, I want to discuss with you, what is a worldly way of looking at Christ? Because God wants to flip that. And he flips that by his love. The first thing that I th just kind of look at this world, um, you know, when you think about this world, and, and what is the worldly point of view? Well, the worldly point of view, especially for those of us who live in the West, who live in America, right? And that's all of us here, right? Um, the worldly point of view is that this life is about ourselves, you know, I was talking about the retreat, about um, this kind of phrase that has been spreading where people say, hey, you know what? You do you, right? Steve, you do Steve. Brian, you do Brian. Grace, you do Grace, right? And I'll do me, you know? And that's kind of the mantra of our lives is that our lives are all about ourselves. We have to grab all the meaning and fun and excitement and goodness and happiness for ourselves. It's me, 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 
right? And in that same way, people see Christ in that way. So we look at Jesus and we see him as a happiness fulfiller. So we go to Christ and we say, Christ, how can you make me happy? Right? So I need your forgiveness. Well, that'll make me happy because I don't like feeling guilty. That's not fun. That's not happiness, right? So I want you to assuage my guilt. Jesus, I want you to give me meaning. Jesus, I want you to help me to get that promotion. Help me to get into that college. Help me to find that soulmate. Okay, you, you got me that? Okay, that's good. Oh, lordship, following you, uh, sacrifice, uh, no thanks. But I'll take the happiness fulfillment. And there's a lot of us that look at Jesus in this way. Jesus is a cosmic genie who is there to grant your wishes and make you happy. And sometimes we encounter this in really spiritual language. We talk about grace and favor. This is a very popular thing nowadays where people say, you know, God is for you. He is showing you favor. So there's going to be good things that happen in your life. And friends, I don't doubt that, but I'm, we're going to talk in a little bit that the good things, grace and favor, isn't necessarily material blessing isn't necessarily happiness by this world's standard. It probably looks different. And I think the Bible is going to show us that. The second way that we may regard Christ from a worldly point of view is we see Jesus as consultant and advisor. We love consultants, right? Consulting is a, a, a really profitable industry, isn't it? You know, you can bill people for an hour for like $200 for expert advice, right? And a lot of us, we seek that. We want people to tell us how to become better, how to fulfill our dreams, how to do things that we cannot do ourselves. And so it is very popular to think of Jesus as a consultant, as an advisor, right? And to say, Jesus, help me to, you know, realize my goals. Help me to move past my fear. Help me to be a better person. And those impulses aren't necessarily bad, but there's a problem, is that the Bible does not talk about Jesus as a, con a consultant and an advisor. It talks about Jesus as King, Lord, the very Son of God. And that's very different than an advisor and a consultant. Because think about who that makes you. You are the client then, right? And you go into a consultant and you pay a fee. I don't know, maybe that's going to church for you. Maybe that's giving an offering for you. Maybe that's, um, you know, your prayers or reading the Bible. You're like, okay, Jesus, I paid my fee. Now I want your advice. But the way it works is that that person works for you, right? And so the clients ultimately can take the advice or not, right? And so if Jesus is our consultant, then, you know, we're like, okay, Jesus, what do you want us to do? Oh, live a pure life? Mm, I don't think so. I don't want to do that right now. Okay, so see, I'm the client, so I get to make the final decision. And a lot of us, we look at Jesus in that way. We look at the things the Bible says, and we're like, mm, that one I really like, because that one helps me achieve my goals. That one makes me feel better about myself. That one involves sacrifice. That one talks about, like, you know, dealing with the poor. I don't like the poor. And then we just ignore that stuff. We just push it aside, and we say, uh, thanks for the advice, Jesus. But I'm going to make up my decision because, hey, I'm the client. I'm the one who gets to determine my own life. And that is the worldly point of view, friends. That is not who Jesus wants to be. And so because of his love for us, that he died for us, he gave everything for us, it flips the script. We can no longer look at Jesus in that way. We did not pay a fee to Jesus. We did not earn anything from Jesus. Instead, he gave it all for us. And it changes the very nature of our relationship with him. And so friends, what God wants to do in our lives, what he's hoping to bring about, well, one thing is he wants us to be involved in his ministry. And that is a ministry of reconciliation. Verse 17, it says, therefore, if any is, anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Right? Out with the old, in with the new, right? Um, this is where we start singing that, um, that, that New Year's song. Let all the acquaintance be forgot. Da -na 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 -na. I don't know the words, but it seems like a nice song, right? But we're going to change. We're going to be new. So what does that look like? The old has gone. The new is here. What is the new? And they tell us, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself 
in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So the new creation is about being reconciled to God and being involved in his work of reconciliation. This is what God wants for the world. At the retreat, we uh, went through you know, several messages and we watched this movie and we were trying to get at this truth, a truth that flies in the face of the lie that we've all been told. And I wanna share that with you. For some of you who weren't at the retreat, Friends, we have been told a lie our entire lives. And the lie is that you are an individual and basically nothing else in this world affects you. It's all about you and you are on your own. Basically, you're just like a machine. You're a machine with flesh and blood, right? And just like machines, you break down, you have parts and all that stuff. But nothing else in this world really matters, right? Like you can just live your life unto yourself. And the truth is, that that's not the case. You are not in an individual. You were always meant to be connected to a whole. God did not just create you. He created all of humanity. And when you even see God create the first man, what does he do when he creates a woman? What does he do when he creates additional human beings? Does God take another lump of clay and make another human being and say, hey, look, I'm making different lumps of clay, right? They're all individuals. No, what does he do? He takes the rib from the man and takes it out of him. And from that rib, he crafts a woman, right? Like that passage was always weird to me. But it points to the truth that we have forgotten, friends, that we are all connected to each other. When one person hurts, we all hurt. When one person is anxious, will we feel that anxiety, right? And friends, uh, I learned this truth where, um, you know, I think a lot of us, like, we're not always convinced that this is the truth. We live this lie that we're individuals unto ourselves. Um, have you ever spent a, a large amount of time with the same group of people, right? Like, I remember going on mission trips where I'm with the same group of people for, like, two weeks. And we had this very important rule whenever we go on missions. We say, no complaining. Right? Because inevitably, you know, missions, like, you know, we're not there on vacation. So times, like, we're in a van that has no air conditioning. We're out there in, you know, a very hot place, and we're serving people. And it's, it's, it's no vacation, right? And there are times where, like, you know, somebody inevitably is like, I'm hot. There's no air conditioning. I don't like this. I'm hungry. Friends, even as you hear me talking like that, what starts happening to you? Are you like, I'm an ind individual. That doesn't affect me. Right? What you say and what you do, that has no effect on me. That's what the world tells you, but it's not true. What happens? Other people are like, hey, man, stop complaining. Why? Because it's affecting you, isn't it? Right? What other people do, what other people say, how other people feel, it rubs off on you. And we know that. And we talked about this at the retreat, that like, if you go to a stadium full of people, has anyone ever invited you to a sporting event that you had no interest in the two teams at all? And you go there, and all these people are rooting for the Lions. And, you know, it just, it's, it's really kind of uh, unfortunate that they're rooting for the Lions because they always let you down. But they're excited. They're like, maybe this is the year. We're actually going to win, and we're not going to blow, you know, a 20-point lead like we did a couple weeks ago. But, you know, they're, they're like, everyone's excited. You're not a Lions fan, but you just got a free ticket from your friend. By the end of the game, what happens to you? You start cheering for the Lions. You start getting excited when the Lions score. Why? You have no interest in the Lions. Maybe you don't even like football. But you went there and you feed off the energy of the other people there because, friends, we are all connected, right? And the truth is that when you see somebody suffering, you suffer too, right? When you see something on TV and you see someone um, that, that is in pain, you feel that pain too, right? That's the way God created us. We have these things called mirrored neurons, that when you ha have had an experience that someone else has had, when you see someone else experience that, your brain registers as if you yourself are experiencing it. So if you see someone on TV get hurt, and you have been hurt at some point like that, neurons start firing in your brain, and you start to feel that hurt, and you go, ooh, you cringe, right? Friends, that's the way we're, de we're designed. 
When you see people do inspiring things, when you see people help other people, when you see people get emotional, what happens? You get emotional too. But in this world, we don't want to do that. Because we're like, no, 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 other people are slowing me down. I need to achieve my dreams. I need to live my life. I'm an individual. I have my own goals, so we, what do we do? We're like, mm, I can't do that. I don't want to feel bad for these people. It's going to slow me down. So we change the channel. We turn away. We start convincing ourselves of this lie. I'm on my own. I got to do me. I got to do Steve. And friends, it's not the truth. God created us to be a part of this community. And so therefore, Jesus came to do something. And for us to be involved in this ministry of reconciliation, for this broken world that is hurting, a lot of us are hurting. A lot of us are disconnected from God, and that is the problem with this world. And so he's trying to reconcile us to him in all the ways that we feel that lack, that disconnection. We all feel it. God is trying to bring us back to him. And he wants to involve us in that ministry. And so friends, for us to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation, there's three questions I wanna ask you. First one is, are you convinced he died for all? He died for all, not just you, right? Because that's what the scripture says. That's the game changer, that Jesus didn't just die for you. And friends, isn't that what a lot of our religion is? One of the most common questions people ask me as a pastor is, Steve, why do I need to go to church? Because they say, I believe in Jesus, so I'm going to heaven. I'm good. And isn't that, you know, kind of the problem? Isn't that kind of missing the point? Jesus didn't just die for you. He died for everyone in this world. So it's not just about you and your connection to God, but it's all of our connection to God, and it's our connection to each other. Right? And so are you convinced that Jesus didn't just die for an individual or individuals, but he died for everyone? It will change the way you look at this world. And the second thing, question, and friends, this is a, a question that maybe might sound kind of harsh, but I'm going to ask it anyways. I don't know what's going on in your life, but I want you to be honest with yourself. Are you living for yourself, just for yourself maybe, or primarily for yourself? When you think about your New Year's resolutions, it's basically just about your own happiness. You know, how you, how you spend your time thinking about your dreams and your hopes. It's all about you. It's understandable. I mean, we've all been there, friends. But do we understand that the truth is not that our happiness only depends on what happens to us, but we're all in this together. And this is the truth that God has been teaching me. That if we live our lives only for ourselves, we will miss out on God's purposes for our lives. I want to say that again, friends, because I think that's really important. If you live your life only for yourself, you will miss out on God's purposes for your life. It's not an optional thing. This is integrally tied to your happiness and meaning in this life. We can't say, okay, I will love people on the side if I have extra time. No, friends. The good life, the abundant life, is to live your life connected to other people, to live your life to heal this world. You ever see, like, you know, when you go and you help someone, you you give money to the poor, you go to a soup kitchen and you feed people food, you know, you go and you help a neighbor in need, you help them move their stuff, you really didn't have to. You see someone who fell on the ground and you help them up off the ground, you help an old lady cross the street, how does that make you feel? Man, that was horrible. Why did I ever do that? Don't you feel alive when you do that? You know, and and there's a lot of us that we're like, okay, but Steve, that's selfish. You know, am I only doing it for myself? Well, the thing is, friends, that if you're only doing it for yourself, then you're feeding into the same system of living just for yourself, right? Just like, okay, I feel better about myself, then I'll move on. But if you realize that that feeling of elation and joy and connection you feel when you live to heal and reconcile a broken world, when you do something kind to another person, that's God's design for you. And if you really understand that, instead of just trying to get the feeling, but you understand that that's your purposes, can you imagine what your life would be like? I have a hard time with that, but I think it would be awesome. I think you would feel so much joy and meaning if you understood that your life was about 
helping other people and healing a broken world, right? I mean, it's weird because we know that. We feel that joy, and yet we've been told this lie. Ah, those people are just in your way. Don't help that person. It's going to slow you down. You're going to be late, and you got to do you. Friends, the world has lied to you. If we slow down enough to help those other people who've fallen by the wayside, guess what? You're helping yourself. You're going to feel awesome because you are going to be living God's purposes for you. Friends, we, we talk about are you living for yourself? And I want to redefine this whole grace and favor thing. 2 Corinthians 6, which is right after the passage we read, says, As God's co workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. There's a really popular preacher who has the largest church in America. He talks about favor all the time. And to him, favor is getting a parking spot at, at the front of the mall. Right? Favor is God just you know, making your life comfortable and easy. And, you, you know, Friends, we look at that, and when it talks about favor here, that's not what we hear. It goes on right after that. What is the favor? What is the time of salvation? What is all this for? Right? If you just heard that, like, now is the time of favor, you could interpret that any way you want, but not if you read it in context. So verse 3, it says, we put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. You see the way that Paul, who wrote this uh, letter, and other people who live for God, the way that they lived, they suffered. They went through hardship. It was difficult. They were beaten and imprisoned, and many of them were killed. Why would they do that, friends? Isn't it in our human nature to want our self-preservation, to want to be happy? Why would they do that? Because they understood something that the world has missed, that that life to live for the reconciliation of others is completely worth it. And Paul says, yeah, you think we're dying, but we are truly living. When we are living to reconcile other people, that's is God's favor. That is the life of grace. That is the life of blessing. It's not when you're comfortable and you have everything you want, and in fact, you have more than you need. You just pile up for yourself stuff. You live that life and you will feel empty. You will always feel poor in spirit. But when you live your life connected to others, Paul is like, man, we are full of joy. You read Paul's letters, and he was a happy dude. He had so much joy, even though he would be imprisoned and stoned and rejected, and people didn't always like him. And it's all the things that we don't want, and yet he's like, man, I have it all. I have it all because I have found a secret. I am living the life of reconciliation. And friends, I want to just spell it out, right, in, in just bold letters. I don't want us to miss this, so we're going to put it up on the screen. This truth, we are all connected. Living to heal this broken world and the broken people in it is God's purpose for your life. We all want to know. You, you ask, God, what do you want for my life? What do you want for my life? And usually when we ask that question, what we mean is, God, what job would you want me to have? God, what school do you, you want me to go to? What person do you want me to marry? And oftentimes what's underpinning that, that question is in order for me to be happy. And oftentimes we don't hear the answer to that question because I think what God is trying to tell us is you're asking the wrong question. You should be asking, how can I live your 
purposes. What is it that you truly want? Not to limit God to, hey, God, I want you to have dominion over these few choices, you know, Harvard or Stanford. Okay, just tell me which one, right? Or, or tell me, you know, which of these, like, jobs that I already want should I take? But instead to say, God, what is it that you truly want? I'm going to leave everything on the table. And what I see from Scripture, what I found in my own heart, is what he wants for you is to live to heal this world to heal broken people, to be a reconciler. And friends, you know, some of you are like, but I'm in school, right? I'm still figuring this stuff out. You know, I don't have a job, and, you know, how am I supposed to do that? Or I already have a job. I can't just up and quit that. Well, friends, can we just take this one step is to say, I'm going to be healer and reconciler wherever I am. You know, today, as I'm going home and I run into someone, can I work to heal? Can I work to, to be kind? Can I work to show love? Wherever you are, you bump into people on the street. You know, you talk to someone in your dorm. Instead of just thinking like, oh, I got to get to my place and I got to do what I need to do. I need to do me. To think, how can I bless this person? How can I love this person? To ask the question, how can you practice the ministry of reconciliation this day? This is the last question. This is what I want to leave you with, friends. How can you live for God's purposes of what he wants? To be the new creation. He died to give everything for you so that you can be a part of what he is doing. Because what he is doing is really, really cool. Can you work to bring about his reconciliation, to bring about his love? Friends, we're going to ask the priest team to come up, and we're going to pray. And if you could pray with me, friends. And, and some of us at the retreat, we've already done this. Um, and some people have come up with a conviction that God has put on your heart. Friends who are at the retreat, I have a question for you. Those who already made a commitment, I, I want to ask, um, is that commitment still there? Or did maybe we wake up this morning, we just forgot all about it? I want to remind you of that commitment. And I want to encourage you to do that. Not because I'm a cruel taskmaster in any way, but because I want you to live God's purposes. Because I want you to be joy, joyful. Because in a way, I want you to be happy. And this is how we get God's joy, is by living his purposes. And so friends, let's live in that joy. Let's live for what God wants for you. How can you be a reconciler? How can you be a healer? What is it that God wants you to do this day? Who is it that God wants you to love? There might be something that's just kind of surprising. You know, let's just take a moment to pray and listen to God. And maybe God's going to put something on your heart where you're like, oh, that person, oh, that's going to be kind of hard. Oh, you want me to do that, Lord? I don't think that's you. No, that can't be you because I don't think I can do it. Friends, that's why we need the connection from God. Because for us to really heal this world, we're going to need his help. You cannot do it on your own. So let's uh, just take a moment to hear from God. And friends, I, I just want to encourage you to be open. Whatever it is that God puts on your heart, if you in obedience could say, God, I don't know what this means. I don't know how I'm going to do it. But yes, I say yes to you. I say yes to your purposes for, for my life. And I will obey. I'm going to need your help. I don't know how this is going to play out. But yes, I want to embrace your ministry of reconciliation. So can we pray that, friends? Let's pray that right now. Let's just take a moment to hear from God. Jesus, what is it that you want me to do this day? What is it that you want us to do to be a healer in this world? There's brokenness all around us. There are people who are poor. There are people who are being mistreated, God. There are people who go without. There are people who need love and are lonely. There are so many ways this world is broken. And God, we are realizing that we are all connected. When they suffer, we suffer. The heart of God breaks. And so may our heart break for the things that break your heart, oh God. Lord, may you show us what it is that you want us to do, Lord. God, may you reveal to us, God, how you want us to heal and reconcile our little corner of the world this day, God. It's not in glory, not to think that's going to come years later when I'm in a comfortable position. To say, even this day, I can be involved in the God, we want to respond in faith to you with all that you are asking of us. 
God, that when you are on our side, we don't need to be afraid of that calling. God, when we live your purposes, that's when we find meaning. That's when we find deep soul contentment and joy. We want to live to heal this world and its people. Because, Lord, we know that that is your desire. In Jesus' name, amen.